I, I work in online sales and operations at Google. And uh, one of the best things about working at Google, where I've worked for, for more than four years, is that since I joined in 2005, I haven't had to buy a new suit. So th this, this thing pretty much comes out at weddings. That's it. And this morning, I was going to wear uh, the normal clothes that I wear into work. And I decided that if I did that, they probably wouldn't let me through the front door of the Four Seasons. So I decided I should, I should crack out the suit for today as well. Um, and being at Google, I thought that I should start my presentation with a quote from Bill Gates. Is anyone here from Microsoft, by the way? I'll, I'll be nice. I'll be nice. In, in around 1995, I, I remember uh, seeing an interview with Bill Gates. And 1995, just if you cast your minds back, was a very different time. It was, a, it was, it was the time, really, the first year when the World Wide Web uh, started to become more prominent amongst normal consumers outside universities. And uh, Bill Gates was interviewed at the time, and it was also around the same time that he uh, wrote this fairly famous uh, internet tidal wave memo to Microsoft employees. And he was asked a question by a journalist, which was, Bill, do you intend to have an internet department at, at Microsoft? And looking back, it kind of seems like a dumb question. But at the time, I don't think it was a dumb question, because a lot of c companies were trying to figure out back then in the mid-90s how they could take advantage of this new phenomenon, which they didn't yet understand, the internet. And his answer was memorable for me. And he said, uh, to create a separate internet department in Microsoft would be like creating a separate electricity department. And think about that for a second. The insight for me was that he believed that the internet should pervade everything that the company did for it to be successful. And if you fast forward 14 or so years and apply that same insight to how you all do marketing in your companies here in Ireland, um, the question is, is digital marketing, is online marketing separate from more traditional marketing that you do? And I guess, I guess the, the most important thing to remember is uh, we have to embrace this change. And you want to make sure that in your company, you don't have a separate electricity department in five years' time. And then when, when I was reading down through the, the attendee list today, I, uh, I saw that there were a couple of people from the electricity supply board here. And I thought, oh, OK, so for the people in the ESB, you should have a separate electricity department. <laughs> but for everybody else, I think you, you should probably not. So my contention throughout the presentation really is that this term digital marketing or online marketing is going to go away. And uh, it's probably going to be sooner rather than later. And the companies that embrace this notion faster will, will do better. And so as I go through the presentation, think to yourselves, do I have a separate electricity department in my company? Now, we're, we're certainly at a unique moment. And the, the couple of economists at, at the start of the day talked about the unique economic challenges we face. But um, we're also at a unique moment in terms of technology. And I think two of the greatest technological forces that we've ever seen are coming together. And that's the internet and mobile. And um, this has been mentioned a good few times today. And I think anybody who's been around the technology industry for 10 or more years is probably sick of the word convergence. I started my career in the mobile phone industry. And we used to spend a lot of time uh, shopping around these graphs of projected mobile data usage. And the graphs uh, had a very attractive hockey, sh uh, hockey stick shape with the huge upsurge in mobile data usage tantalizingly close, just a year or two away. But the time axis kept on shifting. And I worked in the mobile phone industry for a number of years. And I left in 2003. And really, that hockey stick toe still hadn't hit. But it did hit a couple of years ago, in 2007, when the iPhone was released by Apple. And that really changed the game. Uh, can I ask people here, how many people have an iPhone? OK, so, so quite a lot. I think most of you would probably say that it changed the way that you thought about mobile devices, and probably changed the way that you access the internet. 
And it, it, even, even one simple statistic that we've noticed in Google is that uh, people search more than 20 times more if they have an iPhone than if they have a normal phone. But it changes the way they access content on the internet in, in any number of ways. And I think now we're finally at that toe of the hockey stick where mobile data usage is exploding. And if you combine that with the already very rapid growth of internet access, broadband access around the world, where uh, 1.7 billion people around the world now have access to the internet. 1.7 billion, that's nearly a quarter of the world's population. You combine that with this mobile revolution and you've got a really, really big, turbulent set of changes. I think when you're right in the middle of it, it can be hard to realize how big those changes are. But uh, social network has been mentioned quite a lot today. And if you look at products like Facebook or, or Twitter or YouTube, um, they have several hundred million unique users now. And these companies didn't exist six years ago. So I guess my point is that uh, it can be very, very hard to predict the long-term effects of changes as turbulent and as large as this. But anyway, it's, it's fun to try to predict, so we'll, we'll have a go. Uh, and one way to, to predict the future, obviously, is to look back at previous revolutions. And one fairly well-known example is, is Gutenberg and the printing press. Um, uh, so in the 1400s, uh, Gutenberg invented the mechanical printing press. And uh, it was a very large technological innovation at the time because prior to that, the only way of reproducing documents was for monks to transcribe them. And, and so there was, a, there was a whole industry of transcribing these documents. And then the printing press was invented and suddenly, uh, and over the next 40 years or so, about 30,000 titles were reproduced, which is an enormous number at the time. Uh, millions of copies of about 30,000 titles, and the most famous and influential of which was the Bible. And uh, so even though at the time this technological innovation, this revolution, which was really the start of the media age, uh, it seemed significant even then, but it was still impossible to predict some of the longer term impacts that it had. For example, it, in many people's eyes, uh, helped fuel the Reformation because it put the Bible into, the lay, into lay people's hands. They could read and interpret it themselves and it undermined the, undermined the authority of the Catholic Church. So again, all I'm saying is that some of these technological changes, even if they do seem significant today, can have much longer term effects, much bigger effects even than we think they, they will have at the start. And there's, a, there's an interesting quote that I heard before, which is that significant technologies, we often overestimate their impact in the short run, and we often underestimate their impact in the long run. And I think with the internet and with mobile coming together, they may be a good example of this. But we have learned quite a lot about information revolutions over the years. And so, the printing, the printing press and launch of print media uh, was one, but there are others like TV, like radio, and now the internet. And they follow a similar pattern, which will help us predict the future, I think, uh, in how the internet is going to play out. And the pattern is this. It really starts with the technology. So the wireless transmitter, radio transmitter, or the TV, the internet. Then you get the content. So you get the TV programs, the radio programming, you get web pages developing. Then come the users. The users follow the content. And they may pay or they may not. They tend to follow the content. And then after that, usually with a lag, comes advertising. So the advertising comes at the end of this cycle. And uh, depending on the type of revolution, it may take longer. Uh, or, or less time. In the case of the internet, advertising came quite quickly. But what you also see is that when advertising does come, it tends to be advertising for the previous medium, not for the new medium. So what tended to happen when TV exploded uh, after the Second World War was that the first TV ads uh, really harked back to radio ads. And I think the same is true of 
internet ads. And my main point is that we're in the very, very early stages here of internet and mobile and advertising and marketing in these new media. And although we're 10 or 15 years in to the World Wide Web, it's still in the very, very early phases. So let me just, uh, let me just show you an example of a TV ad. This is from 1959. Barbie, you're beautiful. You make me feel my Barbie doll is really real. You can tell it's Mattel. It's swell. Oh, it's kind of cute, really, isn't it? This is from this is from 1959. I think what's interesting about this is that uh, TV broadcast or network TV in the US had been around for more than a decade at that stage. The TV was invented in the early part of the century, but network TV started after the Second World War. So there had been advertising on network TV for almost a decade by the time that this ad was released. And what, what strikes me is that it doesn't really seem like a TV ad, or it doesn't really seem like an ad that's appropriate for the new medium. It looks to me like a radio ad that has been copy and pasted to the new form. And my favorite bit was when the, the, the disembodied arm reaches from the side to pick up the doll. But there was a radio jingle, uh, a radio voiceover, and there was almost no movement. It wasn't really visual. And uh, even 10 years after the, the takeoff of network TV, this was still the advertising that we saw. Now, I'm going to show you a more modern ad. I could have picked any one of, of thousands, but this is an ad that was shown during the Super, Super Bowl this year which is why it's a short ad. And for people who haven't seen the Godfather movie, the, cruci the crucial point to note is that there's a famous scene in the Godfather movie where uh, a guy wakes up and there's a horse's head in the bed beside him. So that's important to know. This is an Audi ad. That's a kind of disturbing ad, actually. But it, it, uh, I think it's at least adapted to the medium. It's, it's visual. There's no, audio, there's no uh, dialogue in it. And there are any number of ads, I think, that, that we could show to show how these ads have adapted to the new medium over the years. And they got better and better and more and more entertaining. Uh, 